Great, let's talk a little about all the other things that we can do with convolutions. So what we did so far is 2D convolution. What we have is we have a 2D image of feature uh, tensor, um, and we go over it as a function of space. Now the, the kernel moves in two dimensions in that case. But of course there's cases, for example, videos, where we deal with three-dimensional data. In that case, we want as output to have a 3D matrix for example, about how things move in space. We will need 3D input. Keep in mind, a video is x by y by time. And the kernel is then three-dimensional. The kernel goes through that entire 3D stack. And the output, therefore, will be three-dimensional. I also want to mention other applications where confidence are useful. For example, on speech recognition. A lot of people, when we talk about speech recognition, immediately think we kernel neural networks. And indeed, they're great, LSTMs, for example. But in a lot of cases, we can uh, be very good using confnets on speech. For example, 10 layers with 3 by 5 convolutions and 3 by one pooling. For example, in the timid class and classifying phone names. I want to mention here the possibility of graph convolutions. There's some beautiful introductions and the application would go beyond what we can do in, the te uh, in this course. But what's the basic idea? A convolution for matrices is just a local combination of entries in a matrix. But let's say we have a graph, for example, people connected with their friends. We can say a local combination is I take the people that are my friends and I propagate something from them to me. And in that sense, we can do the same thing that we do uh, with local features of matrices with local features of graphs. Local is just the adjacent uh, nuance and so forth. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's all kinds of prompts that can be used, for example, when we learn about molecules, citations, social networks, and things like that. They're also important uh, in many uh, natural language processing uh, cases. For example, in text uh, classification, there are still significant cases where confnets are state-of-the-art. Importantly, confnets are relatively easy to train on relatively small computers. Now, another application of confnets is in biology, and because in a way I come from biology, I want to talk briefly about this. Biology has lots of publicly available data. Order 10 to the 8, different protein sequences, 10 to the 7 RNA transcripts, 10 to the 6 uh, human gene expression profiles, and so on and so forth. So from biology, we have these massive data sets that come in that are truly important and may hold the clues to how we should better treat people when they have a disease. This, the amount of that data is very rapidly increasing. Here you see the amount of terabytes of SRA data, which is an important data type in biology, and you can see how quickly it grows over time. This is in terms of terabytes on the y-axis, on the x-axis, the year where they have that data. So you see that it's growing extremely rapidly. Now, convolution often fits well. Why? Well, biological processes happen in real space. So if something happens locally, it could have happened at a different place. So it has the same property where objects, like cans, occur in a given position in the same way a biological phenomenon can happen at a given space. And as such, translational equivariance is often a good choice, and we want to have translation invariant recognition of the relevant phenomena. Here's, for example, an example of a protein. What do non-coding uh, mutations, mutations outside of the genes encoding RNA do? Now, uh, mind you, on RNA, um, th this is a long string that is ultimately used to uh, make uh, proteins. Uh, but, um, but we have on, uh, on our genome, we have parts that are not made into RNA. So what's their role? So we know that non-coding mutations can lead to conditions like polydactyly or increased risk of various diseases. There are billions of potential mutations out there. How do we know which ones are important? Well, we can look, according to the ideas of confnets, we can believe that there's something local about them that tells us about potential to 
produce diseases. So what's the solution here? We use very large data, uh, biological data sets as inputs. We train a ConvNet to predict important features that could, for example, be DNA hypersensitivity, TF binding, histone marks, uh, and so forth. They're all they all have important biological meaning. And then we can use the model to b predict what would change if there was a mutation at a given place. So what's the idea? As input, we take the genomic sequences. And now, just like we did with images, we can say locally we extract features. We have lots of local features. We put them together. And as we go through the network, we basically move between, uh, between convolutions and uh, potentially things like max pooling. Okay, and ultimately we can produce interpretable results. We can, uh, we know some aspects about the biology and then we can ask, does our network filter that out? And we can say, we can encode, say how important something is by the size of the character, which you see here, you see the, uh, the A's, the G's and the T's, which happen to be small in that case. Now, I just want you to play a little bit uh, with this. This isn't because I want you to solve DNA problems in the future, but it's rather I want you, uh, you to see how this idea of confidence can be important well beyond the domains that computer science scientists usually uh, use it and can really have broad applicability to just every aspect of human life. So try out DeepSea and get an idea on how it's solved how it, it sorts of outputs uh, it produces and discuss what kind of other applications of confidence you could envision.